I should take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Philippians. We're in chapter 2, one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I have a thing for uh, presidential movies and uh, television shows, so our uh, video library includes things like uh, The American President and In the Line of Fire and Air Force One and Dave and all seven seasons of West Wing, and almost uh, all presidential shows include the same scene. It's the State of the Union address or some other time when the president is addressing the joint sessions of Congress and the president is waiting outside the the room in the Capitol building where the House of Representatives meet and then the doors swing open and the that I don't know what his title is, but the man walks in in front of the President of the United States and in a loud and majestic voice declares to those who are gathered, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, and everybody gets on their feet and they clap and give him a standing ovation, and congressmen and senators and staff and spectators. It's an entrance that's designed to be a, a grand entrance. It's an entrance that's designed to make an impression on those who are gathered and also an impression on those who are watching on television. A woman by the name of Ruth Glover wrote a poem about another grand entrance. The small gray dove is rudely wakened in the night and from his raftered perch observes with startled eyes the curious sight. What is this straw-lined nest by humans made? Why is this swaddle bundle in its fragrance newly laid? What means this infant cry, the mother's soothing voice? And why do shepherds kneel and in hushed, hushed reverence rejoice? And does the shuttered in and lack of interest mean a creature of small worth? For even birds have nests and boxes hold in which they're young to birth. But love was at the end denied, rejected. Majesty was shunted to a stall. Sovereignty was worshipped by sheep herders. Swaddling bands enrobed the Lord of all. Hope was capsuled in a tiny baby. Omnipotence in bone and flesh was dressed. Resurrection slept within a manger. And life was suckled at a mother's breast. The weary donkey stands with lowered head. A village slumbers careless in its bed. The small dove sleeps and never knows at all that his creator cradles in the stall. I know, it's not a very impressive entrance. It wasn't meant to be. Jesus didn't come to impress people. Jesus came to save people. Jesus came to change people. Jesus came to invite people to become a part of his kingdom. He came to show us what God is like, and he came to show us what God desires you and me to be like as we come to know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus. And that's what Paul meant when he wrote these words in Philippians chapter 2, that you and I should model our lives after Jesus Christ. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so in this passage that we're looking at today, Paul mentions three characteristics of Jesus that God would have us imitate. First, there is unselfishness. Jesus surrendered the glory of heaven for the agony of earth. Hymn writers through the years have captured that thought in the words that that they have set to music. He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha, there to lay down his life for me. My father's house of light, my glory circled throne, I left for earthly night, for wanderings 
sad and lone, out of the ivory palaces, into a world of woe, only his great eternal love made my Savior go. Christ, by highest heaven adored, Christ, the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. This is the way Paul phrased it. Who being in very nature God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness. Jesus had it all. Paul says, being in very nature God. Christ's heavenly home was a far cry from the stable in which he was born. Before he came to earth, he was one with God. He shared the glory of the Father. He was loved by the Father. Infinite intelligence was his. Infinite imagination, unlimited ability to create things. All resources were at his disposal. In his heavenly home, he enjoyed the challenges and the satisfaction of making everything that has been made. He enjoyed the riches and the servants and the allegiance of the heavenly host. The words that Paul uses when he says, being in very nature God, describe what a being is at the very deepest level of that being. In his very essence, Paul says, in his very essence, Jesus was God, unalterably God. John expressed the same thought as he opened his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus willingly and unselfishly laid it all aside in order to come to earth. Paul says he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the form of a very of a servant being made in human likeness to grasp means to hold on to something tightly it means to hug something to your chest for fear of losing it it means to cling to something because you don't want to lose it but what paul says is that jesus demonstrated great unselfishness by releasing what by rights he should have clung to selfishly. He laid it aside, the splendor of heaven, trading it for what he knew he would endure in this world. Jesus was unselfish for us. He gave up glory so that we might enter into glory. He became poor so that we might become rich. He separated himself from the Father so that we might enter the Father's presence. He died so that we might live. That's unselfishness to the extreme. And that's what Jesus modeled when he came into this world. And that's what he invites you and me to do as we interact with the people around us. Not to cling tightly to that which we deserve, but rather to give ourselves away in unselfishness. A second characteristic we see in this beautiful passage is servanthood, that Jesus traded heaven's crown for an earthly towel. It was much more than just leaving heaven to make a trip to earth. He who possessed by absolute right the power and the glory of God, the scripture says, became a servant of the men that he created. He made himself Nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Again, it's that same concept. When it, Paul says he was in very nature God, now he says he became very nature servant. Not putting on a, a face. Jesus was not 
play acting when he became a servant to the very core of his being. As deep down as you can dig, Jesus became a servant when he came into this world. A servant is one who gives himself to meet the needs of someone else. And that so beautifully describes the life and the ministry of Jesus, the way he lived his life here in this world. Jesus was in the middle of a a long journey, and he was tired. And so he sat down to rest next to a well, and his rest was not long because a woman came to draw water from the well and interrupted Jesus. And Jesus set aside his exhaustion set aside his need for rest and enter into that conversation with that woman and drew her into relationship with his father. Jesus had just received bad news. His friend, his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. And this news came to Jesus after a long season of ministering to the people that were flocking to hear him. He preached to them, he healed them, he fed them, and and now here he gets this horrible news about someone that he was very close to. And so he was tired, and and so were his apostles, and he was sad, and so were his closest followers who had also been followers of John the Baptist, and they, they needed to get away from the crowds, and they needed to be refreshed, and they needed to rest. And so the scripture says they went to a solitary place. But the crowds followed them to the solitary place. And so Jesus set aside his exhaustion and he set aside his sadness and he set aside his own need to be refreshed and he taught and he healed and he ministered again to the crowds who came to him. It was the night before he died and Jesus knew that. And so it was the Passover meal and he was sharing that beautiful meal with the 12 who were closest to him. If he'd ever needed a time when others would focus on him, this would have been it. He needed the encouragement of those who were closest to him. He needed the support of those whom he could rely on. He needed the help of his disciples as he faced this most excruciating night and then the next day of his life when he knew that he would die for the sins of the world. And yet, Jesus set aside what he needed. He set aside the encouragement that he so needed. He set aside the support that they could have given to him. And instead he gets up from that table where he's eating with his apostles. And he takes off his outer garment and he wraps a towel around his waist. And he picks up the bowl and he walks from apostle to apostle washing their feet even as he hung on the cross, being executed, bearing the sins of the world, there his focus was not on his own needs, but on the needs of those who were gathered there. And so he turned to the thief who was hanging next to him, and he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And he turned to his mother who was there at the foot of the cross, and he said, John will take care of you. And he turned to John, and he said to John, be sure you take care of her, Jesus not thinking about himself, even as he hung there dying, but thinking about his mother and the thief and others who were gathered there. Jesus described his life well when he said, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. He was the perfect model of someone who willingly and lovingly and consistently gave himself to meet the needs of the people around him. And Jesus continued to serve others no matter what it cost him, even to the point of giving his life for us. And after he washed the disciples' feet in John chapter 13, going from one to another to another, then he said to them, I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done for you. The kind of life that Jesus lived, the kind of service that Jesus gave, is what he invites and asks and commands those of us who love him and follow him and serve him to do for others, that we would give our lives as servants to meet the needs of the people around us. 
And one more characteristic, that would be obedience. Jesus yielded the sovereignty of heaven for the submission of earth. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. The life of man is characterized by disobedience, not by obedience. That's true for my life. That's true for your life. That's true for the life of every other human being in this world. Often we don't obey because we think we have a better idea than the one who is trying to get us to do something. I know that was true for me. I know when I was growing up the reason I didn't obey my parents was because I thought I had a better idea. I thought I knew more than they knew. I thought I knew better how I could meet my needs than they did. I thought I knew better what I could handle than they thought that I could handle. I thought I knew what was best for my life better than they did. And so they told me, don't speed when you drive that car. But I knew I could handle going faster than those signs posted along the side of the road told me that I had to, 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 to travel. And I could handle going faster. I knew better about my abilities than my parents did. And they told me, don't spend your allowance the day you get it. Save some of it for later. But I knew what I wanted. I knew what I needed. I knew that now was the time to get that thing that I wanted. And if I wanted something later, surely I'd be able to find some way to get the money for that too. I knew myself better than they did. I knew what I needed better than they did. Almost all of my disobedience to my parents was because I thought I knew better. Now, I never would have told them that, okay? I was smarter than that, but that's what I was thinking every single time I disobeyed. And although I would never say that to God, that's what I think every time I disobey him. And that's what you think when you disobey him too. I know better than God what I need and how to get that. I know better than him what will make him what will make me happy. I know better than him what I can handle. And if anyone could say that and be right about it in any situation, it was Jesus. If anyone could say, I'm smarter than my parents, I know better than my parents, Jesus could say that. If anyone could say, I know better than the king, I know better than the authorities in the world, Jesus could say that. I mean, even he could make the argument, I know more than my father. I mean, better than I could make that argument, at, at least. But here's the thing, Jesus never said that. He never said that to his parents. He never said that to the authorities in the world. He never said that certainly to his heavenly father. Jesus' life on earth was characterized by obedience. And so when Jesus was 12 years old and his parents went home toward Beth or toward uh, Nazareth without him, leaving him behind in Jerusalem, and they went back later and found him there in Jerusalem. Where did they find him? They found him in the temple, and he was arguing and discussing deep truths with the, the leaders, the teachers, the priests who were there in the temple. And then, just a couple of verses later, after Jesus confounded the greatest scholars in Israel, just a couple of verses later, it says, and Jesus went to Nazareth with his parents and was obedient to them. Jesus was obedient to his parents. And of his heavenly father, Jesus could say, I always do what pleases him. I always do what he wants me to do. Jesus was obedient to God. Perfect obedience is what Jesus modeled. Go to the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus and listen to what he says. I don't want to go through this. If there's any way, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but I'll do what you want, Father. And he walked obediently through the trials and obediently to the cross and obediently to death. The example of Jesus is the example of obedience. And as 
Jesus obeyed, so he also calls us to obey. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Unselfishness, servanthood, obedience. Those are the marks of the life of Jesus. And those are the marks of the kind of life that he wants you and I to lead as well as followers of his. To follow his example, to live as he lived, to imitate him and his life. I read a touching story the other day that happened at Disney World where dreams come true. A small group of children and their parents were inside Cinderella's castle when it happened. It was packed. And suddenly, all the children rushed to one side of the castle because Cinderella walked in. That is, all except one little boy. And he stood on the other side of the room holding the hand of his uh, father. I mean, if the castle could have tipped, it would have tipped to the side where Cinderella was. Cinderella. I mean, you know what she looked like. Beautiful princess typecast to the full extent. Beautiful young girl, perfectly typecast. Gorgeous eyes, every hair in place. Flawless skin dressed in that beautiful gown that Disney made for her. And she stood waist deep in a garden of children, and they were all clamoring uh, for her attention. They wanted to touch her and to be touched by her, except that little boy. And he was there on the other side of the room. Maybe he was seven, maybe he was eight. It was hard to tell because his body was disfigured, dwarfed, deformed face. And he stood there watching, longing. You know what he wanted. He wanted to be with the crowd right there with Cinderella, but he was afraid of rejection again, that he'd received many times. And then an incredible thing happened. Cinderella noticed the boy on the other side of the room. And she made her way through the crowd of children that were gathered around her, not hurting anybody, but nonetheless intently making her way through the crowd until she broke free and walked across the room and got down at the level of the boy's little face and leaned over and kissed him. Beautiful story, isn't it? But today we're not talking about a fairy tale princess. We're talking about the real prince of peace. And we're not talking about a deformed little boy. We're talking about the entire human race that's been disfigured by sin. We're talking about God who stepped away from his castle to walk in the gutters of humanity. We're talking about God who wrapped his arms around us though we're disfigured and vile and whispering in our ear, I love you, and then turning and shouting that same message so that everyone can hear. We're talking about God who saw the dirt that covered our soul and used his blood to wash it clean. We're talking about God who proved himself unselfish, a servant, obedient. And we're talking about God who asked us to do the same because your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not regard equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness Being found in human likeness, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the example of Jesus beautiful example, beautiful life. And Lord, I would pray that you would help me moment by moment and day by day and year by year to be conformed to the image of Jesus, to follow his example, to imitate his life. I'm a long way from that now, but I pray that slowly, surely, you would conform me to that image. And I pray the same for my friends who are here today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's stand and sing our song of commitment. And if God is working in your heart in some way, you need to talk to someone or pray with someone, be happy to talk with you and pray with you as we sing together. Great week. God bless you.